Rohit, thanks for being here with us. It's great to be here and missing all the bad weather on the East Coast, so I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. So big news out of, out of reInvent last week was Nova, as Andrew said. Um, you, know, you, you finally have a, a family of, of large language models out there. I guess a lot of people are wondering, though, what took you so long? <laughs> I thought it was very fast. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, first, very excited for what we did with Amazon Nova. It's our next generation of foundation models that we introduced to the world last week. Uh, let me take you a bit behind the scenes of uh, uh, where I sit. I have the world's best seat to thousands of generative AI applications being built by our internal teams. And we're noticing three very important things. One was choice and importance of selection. So if you look at Amazon Nova uh, foundation model family, it's not just one model. We actually introduced six models. Five of them are generally available as of last week. And they start with uh, one of the models, which is a text-only model, which is called micro, which, by which you mean that you can uh, take any text input and output text. And then there are three models of varying in increase in size and intelligence that are taking multimodal input as an in image, text, and video, and generating text. Uh, and then you have two additional models that are using uh, tech, taking text as input or images and generating images and videos. Those are called uh, Nova Canvas and Nova Real. And the reason we did that, because we found internally people were using very different models, and they had very different needs for their applications. So that was, goes down to the selection of what you need to do to build. And then secondly, as uh, people move from experimentation to large scale loads, we were finding that cost is becoming increasingly important. So these models are 75% less expensive than their counterpart, best performing models on Bedrock, which is our service where you have many different model uh, providers available with their foundation models. So clearly cost was a big deal and uh, so good uh, to see that the team did massive invention to bring costs down. And lastly, as you know, with these foundation models, it's not just about the model's capability or cost, but you have to deliver a very good user experience. And after time for the user experience, factors like latency matters. So all these models, especially on the ones which take uh, image, video, and text as input and output text, they are lightning fast. Uh, so those were the things that we worked on, and I'm very excited about the future, and we are looking to the next generation of NOVA as well now. Great. I, I think with all these models, one of the big questions people have is, is data. You know, where, did you, where did the data come from that, that was used to train NOVA? Yeah, we don't disclose the specifics of the data, but it's a factor of uh, many factors. One is sources, of course, the publicly available data. Uh, and second, we have a lot of proprietary data, and we also license data from many providers. Yeah, that's interesting. Licensing seems like it's becoming more of a norm in the building of these models uh, now, whereas it may not have been in the past. Yeah, I think you want to, uh, to trust with the publishers and everything is super important, and we want to make sure that you're using the data the right way, and all that is super critical, and I think the con uh, we are very excited about some of the partnerships we have made on the data side as well. Fantastic. Um, so now Nova's out, um, but a lot of people are still waiting uh, for an update to what is maybe Amazon's sort of best known product when it comes to, to AI, which is the Alexa Digital Assistant. Um, I know you guys said there would be a new Alexa coming, but uh, you know, when is it actually going to arrive? Yeah, as you know, Jeremy, uh, Alexa is near and dear to me. Uh, I joined Amazon more than a decade back to build Alexa, and it's been a very fulfilling experience. Uh, we are right now uh, in the midst of re-engineering Alexa with the latest of state-of-the-art foundation models so that it can be the world's best personal assistant. We are going to be true to that uh, North Star that we set ahead, and a lot of people scoffed at us when we were looking at that, but that's a reality. You can have your world's best personal assistant available to everyone. And what I see in our labs is super exciting. So all I can say today is stay tuned, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> So no, no timeline, not? <laughs> no timeline yeah. right now, just stay tuned. <laughs> OK, well, we'll stay tuned. Um, and I want to come to the audience for questions in a minute, so please think of your, your questions. Um, one of the things with Nova, I mean, you built that, mo those, that family of models in-house, but you also have uh, this close partnership with Anthropic. You made investments in them. You have the strategic uh, relationship with them. And I know they've been helping you on, on some things. Um, Oh, you know, why, in some ways, why build your own, own family of models if you have that relationship with Anthropic and they have very capable models of their own? Yeah. 
First, uh, we love Anthropic. Uh, the partnership has been great. And I'll go back and reinforce what, where I started what, uh, what we saw was happening internally. Customers want choice. We have seen that many times in our internal Amazon stores, if you look at how many different selection we have there. And same in AWS. There's not just one database solution. There are multiple ones. Same is turning out to be true in the foundation models. Our customers do want choice. And the partnership with Anthropic and what we did with Amazon Nova is just accentuating the, uh, the choices available for our customers. Um, so the, the relationship Amazon has with Anthropic is somewhat similar to the relationship you know, Microsoft has with OpenAI. There's been some reports in that relationship between Microsoft and OpenAI that there's some tension. What's the relationship like with Anthropic? And is there any, are there tensions in that relationship where they want more compute out of Amazon than, than you guys can give them? Or you're not getting the, you know, what you feel like you need from them in terms of innovation on, on the model side? I think we, as I said, we love the partnership. I think nothing more to uh, state here than that the partnerships are going great. And you saw some of that at reInvent last week. Great. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion right recently about progress in large language models hitting a wall. What's your view on that? I think that's a very debatable uh, question in terms of what wall is coming. I think we have to be very careful about uh, what we have seen in AI every time. Every time we come close to a wall, there's a new invention. I think we'll keep finding that if you see what was happening with pre-training, which is where you build a token predictor, and post-training where you're giving the, the model a lot of different tasks. Now it's shifting to inference. Uh, we are spending a lot more time as an inference, and at the same time, as I mentioned with Nova, we are making inference cheaper, uh, which means I think the uh, scaling is curve is changing from different stages of training to inference, and we'll continue to see that. I'm very optimistic that in AI, every uh, sometimes every decade, sometimes every five years, every three years, you continue to ship the curve up on performance, and I think that's going to be true again in this coming years. Are you working on a reasoning model that would use sort of test time inference the same way as the O1 model from, from OpenAI does? Again, I, uh, I won't go to the specifics of it, like in terms of there are many different ways. What we are really building is for AI to be useful in real world practical applications. And a lot of that res, uh, requires reasoning of many different kinds, not just mathematical reasoning, but more utilitarian reasoning as well, where you're trying to do tasks in the real world. And that's where, I th uh, if you look at AI agents, you have to get to the point where they're not just solving a coding problem or math problem, but they are calling the Uber for you or making a, a reservation for you, which are not really high on intellectual proficiency, but require a lot of world knowledge to do it right. So that's where the field is evolving right And is now. that where Amazon's heading is towards agents and, and making agents available? Yeah, I think if you saw like what we uh, talked about with our Rufus, which is a shopping assistant with Alexa, which I think of as a super agent, agent because it does many different things, that's where the world's gonna go. Great. I want to get a question from the audience. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. If not, I've got lots of questions for Rohit, so keep going. There's a, a woman down here. Wait till we can get a, a mic to you, if we can get a, a mic handler. Just the woman in red, just down here. And if you could please state your name when you stand up and where you're from, that would be great. Thank you. Hi, how are you? My name is Lorenza, and um, I work currently for the press uh, at The Economist. And uh, yeah, I would love to well, we know that uh, Jeff Bezos is back working uh, at uh, Amazon full time, and uh, yeah, would love to to know whether you've had uh, you know uh, work with him in, in certain projects and what is his vision. Has he mentioned any specific vision uh, that you can share with us uh, uh, on his mind? I would say you should ask that to Jeff. But yes, he's very involved, as he said. Uh, I love the partnership with Jeff. I've worked with him early days of Alexa too. And he's still very much connected with AI elements of uh, where I spend a lot of time and I get to see him. So very fortunate with that partnership and mentorship. Great. Um, I want to ask a question about AI's energy demands. We had an interesting uh, session this morning at a breakfast on this topic. How is Amazon looking at, at the, the huge energy demands that uh, particularly these foundation models seem to require? Yeah, I uh, personally, on my front as well, I want AI to be sustainable. And I love that at Amazon, especially with AWS, what we are doing is we are looking at the end-to-end -end life cycle of sustainable AI. And it starts with, I think, our chips. One of the main things why we have our uh, ML accelerant chips, like Tranium, is essentially to drive better price performance so that you are able to build these foundation models in a much, uh, much better and sustainable fact, uh, fashion. 
And specifically, if you look at our announcement last week on Trainium 3, which is our third generation of Trainium, that is 40% more price performant than Trainium 2. So that kind of uh, 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 step function improvement in price performance is where I think sustainability will be key. At the same time, on, in, in parallel, in our data centers, we are trying to use as much renewable energy as possible. We have partnership with a company where we are absorbing the carbon that's getting emitted. All of that is key for making computing more sustainable. So, and I think as a whole, the industry needs to look at it even more carefully. And is model optimizations, because some people worry that, okay, you make the, the models more efficient, then people just use more of it. It's called the Jeevan's paradox, uh, uh -huh. you know, and actually the, the overall consumption is higher. Is that a concern? Are you seeing uh -huh. that also as you drive down model price? Are you seeing usage actually increase overall? Yeah, this actually validates what we did with our own models. If you look at uh, the model family we launched with Amazon Nova, uh, the, uh, we are taking a lot, doing a lot of work to bring the capabilities of the large model into the smaller form factors or smaller sizes through a suite of techniques. And this is where, uh, if you look at where you're going, uh, Jeremy, with it, like inference is becoming a building block that every application in the world will use. This is why if you thought about it as a per request inference or a per token request, each of that has to go down by a factor of factors, right? I mean, and of late, we have already managed to get an order of magnitude faster with our inference and more efficient, but we need to continue doing that work, and I'm very optimistic that we'll do so because our customers want it again, right? right? This is where inference as a building block is such a key element for us to think about as you're building applications. Thanks, Ray. Um, I, I, there's a sort of war, war for talent going on out there. How's Amazon sort of competing in that war for talent? How are you able to kind of retain the, the engineering talent you need? I think one thing I cherish about Amazon that it has uh, world's most customer obsessed scientist and ML talent in the world. Uh, because here we are looking at what's the best way to solve and build real practical AI solutions. So I'm very uh, proud of the team that we already have. Uh, we just today announced our uh, San Francisco AI hub, uh, which is very crucial for this. Like we have had a presence in Sunnyvale for a long time, but we said we need to be in the city. <laughs> so this is why we are in the city now. That's why I was also here today. And so uh, that be, I think it's great times uh, for AI scientists and AI practitioner. But the good news for all of you in this room is that the bar to build with AI has suddenly reduced. You don't need a PhD in machine learning or mathematics to build with AI. Uh, this is the way where you now can just prompt these systems or uh, run a lot of experiments where you don't need to be the AI expert. And uh, frankly, I believe that more and more work will be now at the application layer as well, where you'll see that again, a PhD in machine learning is not required. If you could tell the audience, a lot of whom are trying to figure out how to get ROI from AI in their own businesses, you know, the, if there's just one piece of advice you could give them on how to do that, what would it be? Well, first, two things. Uh, as Let's just stick to one. We're going to run out of time. <laughs> so uh, first, I think we are seeing a phase where uh, uh, generative AI is moving from experimentation to real production use cases, which is very positive. And what I'm seeing is that we, uh, if you look at our development environment, we now can save 4,500 hours of SD, uh, software development engineer's time, because you don't need to do a Java migration with a lot of people. You can simply do it with the five people in a room. That's incredible. So my last minute advice for you on that one would be focus on getting your data right, your decisions in your uh, daily workflow captured, because there's, the magic in AI is that once you have the data and the decisions, it can learn. If you don't have the data and the decisions, it's not going to work. So right. focus on so, getting so your data. So get your data right. I'm afraid we're out of time, but Rohit, thank you so thank much you so for much. being with us. Thank, thank you for having me here. Thank you.